today our travels take us to ancient Egypt, one of my favorite stops along the way when we're time traveling and talking about artwork. A couple of things we have to keep in mind about ancient Egyptian artwork. First of all, you have to understand something about Egyptian religion because the religion and the artwork are so intertwined it's really hard to talk about one without talking about the other. And of course the Egyptian gods and goddesses do play a fairly major role in the artworks of ancient Egypt. First thing to keep in mind about the, uh, the religion of ancient Egypt is that they were polytheistic. Now, if you've ever seen the prefix poly, it means many or lots of. Polytheistic. Theistic means they had gods. So, many gods. And that is true. They had gods for everything. Anything you can possibly imagine, they had gods for. Now, I mean, we've all heard of Ra, the sun god, but that was just one sun god. There was, uh, you know, his son Horus, who was also a sun god. The, each individual pharaoh was sort of an aspect of Ra, the sun god. And then they combined gods like Amun-Ra, uh, who was two different gods, but then combined as one god. And lots lots of gods. The other thing to keep in mind about ancient Egyptian artworks is that it did not serve the same function in society that artwork does in our society. It's not like the Egyptians were saying, well gosh, you know, this tomb just doesn't, just doesn't pop to me. It just doesn't feel comforting and homey. Let's, let's put some paintings on the walls and make it better. Also, what you have to keep in mind about the ancient Egyptian uh, religion is they believed in immortality. Now, what is immortality? Well, that is living forever and ever and ever. Their concept of immortality came with a warning. It was only really, it had conditions with it, all right? There were some caveats, if you will. Um, they believed in immortality as long as the body itself was actually preserved. This led to the practice of I'm sure we're all fairly familiar with the idea of mummification. Basically, when you have a dead body, you would cut it open, you take out all the squidgy bits that might rot and do things like that, uh, you would mummify those separately. How do you mummify things? You would pack it in natron, which is a type of naturally occurring salt, kind of like baking soda. Uh, you'd pack the body in that for about 70 days. The body would turn into essentially beef jerky, uh, and then you would wrap it up in lots and lots of linens with protective spells, protective amulets, protective jewelry, and things like that. And then it would be ready to go into a tomb and be kept there for a very long time. The concept of immortality and the belief of this afterlife where you would just live forever and ever, it wasn't just like you'd go to a party up in the clouds and just be there forever, chilling, relaxing, and having a good time. No, 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 that's not it. For one thing, the Egyptians believed that immortality was like a bring-your-own-food picnic. You can eat everything you want as long as you brought it. This leads to some problems, doesn't it? Let's think about this for a second. Let's just think in terms of cheeseburgers. Okay, good. Now let's think of, uh, okay, it's an ancient Egyptian cheeseburger. How many cheeseburgers can you eat in one day? All right, I, I just, let's say three. Okay, let's say three cheeseburgers. Three cheeseburgers a day times how many days in the year? Okay, well, let's do some math here. Three times 365, okay. So three cheeseburgers, 365 days a year. Um, so that would be, wait, hang on. <laughs> Gonna need my calculator for this one. Three times 365 equals 1,095 cheeseburgers. That's only for one year. How long is eternity? Oh, okay, that's longer than that. So let's uh, times 10, right? Mm-hmm, times 10, that's gonna give us 10,950 cheeseburgers we'll need for just 10 years. Eternity is longer than 10 years, isn't it? Yeah, immortality lasting forever longer than that. Okay, so let's uh, times 10 again. Now I think we're up to 1,000 years, right? Okay, so we would need 109,000 500 cheeseburgers for just the first thousand years. <clears throat> now here's another problem to keep in mind. 
put that away. So you have a family member who's just passed away, you're trying to get the money together for a tomb, you're trying to get the money together to mummify them, and now you also have to come up with, and even if you're ordering off of the dollar value menu, you've got to come up with $109,500 to feed your, your deceased uh, the loved one for the first hundred years. Hmm, that's a big problem, isn't it? Now, another problem. Let's say that you get this many cheeseburgers and you bury them in the tomb with the person who's being buried. Um, that's a lot of food that the living can no longer eat, right? Ah, okay. So here's the solution. Somebody very early in ancient Egyptian ideology came up with the idea. So, you know, instead of burying that many cheeseburgers with the person, got a better idea. They said, how about, hear me out, hear me out, just don't say no yet, what if, instead of burying all those cheeseburgers with the person, what if we painted a cheeseburger on the wall? Work with me here. Okay, so what we're going to do here, we're going to make a magic eternity burger. Okay, and we're going to have lettuce on it. We'll have it exactly the way you like it, okay? All right, we've got the burger. Want cheese on that? Yeah, okay, cheese. Right, we're gonna make the cheeseburger. Okay, how about onions? Yeah, okay, onions. Tomatoes, yeah, okay, all right. Tomatoes, here we go. Make it just the way you like it. Down at Burger Pharaoh, we do it your way. The double, make it a double? Yeah, okay, cool, all right. All right, there we go, good. Oh, wait, wait, do you want sesame seeds on it too? Open sesame, all right, let's do it. Let's do some sesame seeds up on top. I'm sure you want fries with that too. I mean, it's eternity, right? You don't have to worry about cholesterol. Okay, so let's do some fries over here. That's the fry package. There we go. I'm sure you want to drink with that as well. Supersize it? Why not? It's a desert country. We're going to get thirsty. There we go. Okay, we got the burger. We got the fries, we got the drink. The spirit of the dead person can now feast upon the spirit of the artwork, and we don't have to bury real food in there with them. We can keep that for the living. Oh, we need some magical napkins too. All right, I'm gonna put some magical napkins. There you go. Kind of looks like the cheese. That's all right. Now, what happens after the spirit of the deceased person consumes the spirit of the artwork? There's no more left, right? Oh, that could be a problem. Somebody came up with this great solution. The solution they came up with was with an Egyptian hieroglyphic character, which looked a little like this. Now, what that symbol means is thousands of, all right? So now we have a magic spell. We have thousands of drink, thousands of cheeseburger, thousands of french fries ready for the spirit of the deceased. So think about it this way. Artwork in ancient Egypt, uh, a lot of it, especially from the tomb paintings, the artwork is not to make something look pretty. It's not to be decorative. Uh, what it is for is to magically provide for the needs of someone in the afterlife. Is that the way we think about artwork in our society? Um, not most of us, I won't say none of us, but not most of us. Most of us don't think that way. But in Egyptian art, that's what a lot of it was for. Now, with that in mind, let's take a look at this tomb painting from the tomb of Neb Amun. So what we have here in the Neb Amun painting, this is called Fowling in the Marshes, and the, the scene was actually fairly common in Egyptian artworks uh, for tomb painting. What we're seeing here is not a picture of someone in life, but actually a wish for them in the afterlife. Now what Nebamun is doing is he is 
out hunting. That's what he's doing, all right? What's he standing on? He's standing on a P-Row. Where is he? He's out in the swamps. What's he got with him? Well, if you look in his upraised hand, all right, what's up in his hand? It's not a snake. It looks like a snake, but it's not a snake. What it actually is, is a hunting stick. When you go out trying to catch birds, you would take your stick with you, and then as the birds flew up, you would throw it and try to bring one down. Now, Hancock County, Mississippi, when you go hunting, what animal do you take with you? Dog! That's right, you take your dogs with you. In ancient Egypt, they didn't take their dogs with them. They would take their cats. They would take the hunting cat. Here's the reason why, and you might think, well, that seems kind of peculiar. Why on earth would they take hunting cats? Well, cats are actually really good at bringing down birds. In fact, I used to have a cat. His name was Babu. Babu the cat was kind of portly, kind of pudgy. Uh, he would lie around on the front porch taking a nap. Some days, I, I would leave for work in the morning, I would come home in the afternoon, he would be sleeping in the exact same spot. Hadn't moved at all, as far as I could tell. Some days, I checked to see if he was still breathing. This cat, though, who was just, oh, he was a good boy, but lazy. Uh, I saw him on several occasions take a flying leap into the air and bring down a bird in flight. So uh, hunting cats are amazing. All right, and that's why the Egyptians would use them. Now, let's take a look at the people in the Neb Amun painting. First of all, the biggest person standing there is Neb Amun himself. Behind him is his wife. And his wife, honestly, she's not dressed to go hunting. She is dressed to go to a party. She has her necklaces on. She has her fanciest clothes on. So she's ready to go to a party. Now, here's something I want you to notice about Neb Amun and his wife. In ancient Egyptian artworks, size tells you how important something is. A person's size tells you how important they are in an artwork. All right? The bigger a person is, the more important they are. The smaller a person is, the less important they are. Now, if you look at the painting of Neb Amun, you will see that his wife comes about up to his elbow. Does that mean she was a very, very short person? Doesn't mean that. What does it mean? Ah, yes. It tells us that at least in his mind, uh, she was not nearly as important as he was. Now, let's, let's return to the scene for a second. So, what we see here with the Neb Amun painting is a guy who wants to spend all eternity out hunting and fishing. We see fish down in the water, we see birds up above, he's bird hunting, uh, he's got his hunting cat with him. Remember what I said about size being equal to importance. I would like you to look at the person in between his legs, all right? That little tiny person down there, that's actually his daughter. Now, here we have Neb Amun, great big, and then we have his wife behind him, and then his daughter underneath. Here's something I want you to, to, to notice. Measure the size, check out how big his daughter is, and compare it to the size of his hunting cat. Mmm, what can you tell me about that? What that tells me is, to Neb Amun, his hunting cat was actually slightly more important to him than his daughter. I know, right? Well, I guess you can't fault a guy for that. Good hunting cats are hard to come by. Uh, so that's what we're seeing here. We are seeing a magical wish for the afterlife. We are not seeing a documentary. This is not something that actually happened. We are seeing the Egyptian uh, way of wishing people in the afterlife.